It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! Woohoo! The crowd goes wild. Hello, everybody. I am so excited to do this week's show because we're going to talk about the five microphone mistakes you might be making. <laughs> if you're not already a subscriber, click the red button to make sure that you don't miss any episodes because they are wonderful every single time. Um, if you like something that you learn on today's show, don't be afraid to give us a thumbs up, give us a little love. And if you've got some mic techniques that you would like to share with us, um, drop them in the comments when the archive, uh, the show goes up after the live show. And whoever gets the most likes on their comment is going to get a free taxi t-shirt, just like Super Blonde won last week. I don't see Super Blonde in the chat today, but Super Blonde, um, yeah, you got yourself a t-shirt. So Liz will reach out to you to find out what size. And if you want the white one or the Heather Gray one, and very, very cool. All right. Um, almost every studio at home needs a microphone, right? At least one. Um, even if you're doing almost all instrumental stuff, sooner or later, you're going to need a microphone. Let's make sure I'm even... Am I on? <laughs> Nobody's saying hello. There I am. Okay, I'm there. Um, anyway... Uh, but a lot of people who buy microphones these days, you know, take recommendations online. They don't know about a lot, a lot about microphones. And I think that they make some bad choices and they don't know much about the different types of microphones. So I've seen some people on YouTube making some incredibly just like dopey microphone mistakes, like really mind blowing to me. Um, so I'm going to highlight what some of the most common mistakes that people make with microphones. And I'm also going to give you some tips for some good mic techniques in common uses after we go through the mistakes. Uh, what I'm about to share with you is based on my personal experience. Um, I, I've literally spent thousands, maybe thousands upon thousands of hours in, in big time recording studios. I learned from some of the best in the business. Um, some of the best engineers, producers, and we didn't have things like MIDI back in my day. So everything was done with uh, mics and wires and I learned a lot. So I'm happy to share that with you. Um, as with most studio equipment, there are many, many, many ways that you can do things. So like I said, this is these are my personal opinions, my experience, uh, my techniques, mostly <laughs> stolen or given to me by others. But, uh, you know, other people may have a different way that they skin the cat. Uh, very few absolutes in recording techniques. But the lack of understanding of some of the basics of microphones is always a mistake. So let's get started. Wow, Peter Rahill says, back in his day, they had to sing through rocks. Does that mean that you were stoned at the time? But a boom. Do I have a drum for that? Uh, no, I've got, <laughs> that's what I've got for that. Anyway, um, all right, here we go. Microphone mistake number one is not knowing the difference between dynamic mics and condenser mics. Um, this is probably the most well-known uh, dynamic mic in the world, the venerable Shure SM57, which is a great microphone. And this is a condenser mic, which is the Gage Microphone ECM87, which is kind of modeled after a Neumann U87. Rob Shirelli used to own the, the Gage, he started the Gage Microphone Company and uh, had these built to his specifications and every single one of them that came in was ear checked either by Rob or his partner Chandler Bridges at the time. So great microphone, really cheap. It was like $99. And uh, I was one of the six people that did the ear checks on them. And I uh, got to say, they sounded really good. Anyway, microphone mistake number one, not knowing the difference between dynamic mics and condenser mics. So dynamic mics use a diaphragm a voice coil and a magnet to pick up the sound waves and then convert those into an electrical signal. It's basically 
if you think about it, the same design as a speaker, but in reverse and used to pick up sounds, whereas the speaker pushes them out, microphone gets them on the inbound side. Think of the di diaphragm on dynamic mic as the cone of a speaker. Um, instead of the voice coil vibrating and projecting the sound outward, like I said, the sound comes into the microphone, it moves the little diaphragm, which excites a, a coil around a magnetic core, which generates an electrical impulse, and that is what turns into sound. Condenser mics, on the other hand, use an electrically charged diaphragm. Uh, it's basically kind of a hoopy looking frame about yo big. Um, and it's got a piece of super thin mylar stretched across it. And the mylar is sputtered with a very fine layer of gold mist, I guess. Uh, and, and so it has a negative charge and a positive charge, and whenever that diaphragm moves, that piece of mylar moves, that generates sound. So dynamic mics are more rugged. I mean, it's, I swear you could drive nails with this. Um, and they can handle louder sound sources, like guitar amps. They're pretty famous for guitar amps. They're also used a lot on snare drums, but they can be used on other instruments. The 57 is a pretty good sounding mic. Um, but they're less sensitive and they have lower output. So that is to be remembered. Condenser mics, however, are generally less rugged. Yeah, you don't want to drive nails with this one. <laughs> and uh, where am I? Dynamic mics. Uh, oh, um, you don't want to use a condenser mic, generally speaking, on super loud things like guitar amps or drums. However, uh, this mic doesn't have one, but there are many of them that have switches on the back, which will say, like a Neumann U87 would have a little switch that you push or slide to the right, and it says minus 10, and that is called a pad. And what that does is it pads the level down. It's not a physical pad, like a blanket or anything. It's an electrical pad that reduces the amount of signal so it doesn't crap out the mic. So you could use this on a guitar amp, you could use it on a drum, um, and uh, you would just have to pad it so that the impact of the drum hit or a screaming guitar lead or a power chord doesn't crap out the microphone. Now, excuse me, here's an interesting thing, which is dynamic mics used to be considerably cheaper than condenser mics, but over the years, um, a lot of manufacturing has moved offshore. Uh, I, I would say America, Switzerland, um, Germany and maybe to some extent Great Britain were probably the leading sources of microphones back in the day and now just a, a shooting from the hip guess, I would say like 80% of all microphones are, are manufactured in China now. Many of them are knockoffs. Um, the quality is variable between the different factories. So sometimes you get a good one off the assembly line. It's amazing for the price. And that brings me back to the point, which is you can now buy a microphone like this for $99, which is a condenser, or a dynamic like this, also for $99. So mistake number one is not knowing which type of mic is the best choice for the type of recording you plan to do. And for God's sake, don't choose a microphone because it looks cool and professional. I swear a lot of people do that. Um, yeah, don't buy them for how they look. Buy them for how they sound and trust the opinions of people who are like real engineers, not somebody with a home studio who's got that one microphone and loves it because they bought it and they tell everybody, yeah, it's great. I'm not so sure they've had a lot to compare it to. They may be wrong. Um, by the way, I also want to mention that there is another type of microphone that I'm not really going to talk about today because it's used so infrequently, comparatively speaking, in home studios, um, and that's a ribbon microphone. And just to give you a quick education on that, a ribbon microphone is kind of like a condenser microphone, but the ribbon is actually a little piece of... Uh, I'm looking for... <laughs> imagine like a little strip of tape or mylar uh, between two little rails that look kind of like a ladder in the middle of the microphone, you know, in there. Um, and that vibrates uh, and acts kind of like a condenser mic as well, kind of. Uh, but ribbon mics uh, are like, remember the old RCA 70s, I think they're called 77s and 44s, the big like, you know, 
announcer microphones from back in the 50s and 60s. A lot of those were ribbon mics. Um, Bayer makes ribbon mics. And they sound really good on some things, like brass, for instance. But they're a little finicky. They don't like humidity. They need to be taken care of. They don't like dust. They don't like loud signals. Um, so a lot of people don't use them in home studios, and probably for good reason. All right. Microphone mistake number two is not knowing what a polar pattern is and how the different types of patterns will work best for your needs. There are three patterns, and boy, you guys are going to be impressed today because I've got graphic aids. Whoops, I should switch over so I'm watching what you guys are seeing. There you go. That, my dear friends, is what is called a cardioid pattern. Notice how at the top of the drawing, the obviously this is like a bird's eye view looking down on a microphone from the top and you can see where the windscreen is and where the mic cable is so a cardioid pattern is meant to pick up sounds that are in front of it and reject sounds that are in back of it okay um, i'm not going to cover hypercardioid today that's just a little narrower version of this and i guess there are you know, maybe 10% of the cardioid mics out there might have a hypercardioid option on them. Um, it's, it's just not worth discussing. For your purposes, home studio enthusiasts, cardioid is what you need to know about. Uh, the next type we have is called an omnidirectional pickup pattern. Notice that it picks up everywhere, 360 degrees around that microphone. So it doesn't matter if the sound source is coming at it from the, the side with the windscreen or the side with the cable or to the left of it or to the right of it or below it or above it, doesn't matter. It picks up everything. Think of it as a sphere of pickups, okay? Um, and one pattern coming up that I believe is highly underrated, highly underutilized, is the famous figure eight, or as we used to call it before it became unacceptable language, the bipolar pattern. Um, it picked up in front and it picked up behind, but notice that it rejects the sound. It didn't have, it doesn't have great pickup on the sides. So therefore, uh, you, it's got some really cool applications that I will talk about in a moment. Um, but let's go back here to cardioid. And cardioid is often the best choice for many applications. Um, here's a good example of why you want a mic in cardioid with a cardioid pattern. And that is because let's say you are miking a vocal out in the studio and their guitar amps and their drums and their other things. Well, if you have the vocalist facing the band, the back of the microphone where the cable is in this drawing um, is now pointing towards the rest of the band, hopefully the drummer, because the singer would be looking at the drummer or the guitar player, the keyboard player, bass player, whatever. And the back of the microphone is where the sound is being rejected from. So the singer is being picked up singing into the front of the microphone but you are dramatically reducing the amount of room noise other instruments that are bleeding into the microphone so that's a great reason for it um, there have been times where i've recorded two guitar players that are kind of near each other um, and i set it up so that their guitar amps were blowing at each other uh, with the microphones up against the grills on each amp, but the backs of the mics were facing the other amplifier. So therefore, you picked up primarily the signal from the amp that you wanted to record and not the one that was 20 feet away on the other side of the room because you had rejection. So there you go. Um, I'm reading my own notes here. <laughs> okay. Uh, Oh, uh, acoustic guitars, when you need to reject drums, that's another great application um, for a cardioid mic. And, and most mics are cardioid. Um, it usually is a more expensive mic that's got choices of polar patterns where you can select cardioid or omni or figure eight or hypercardioid, whichever complement of those they have. 
Um, so the Omni pattern, going back to Mr. Omni here, the Omni pattern, as you can see, once again, picks up 360 degrees. So it can be useful when you want more of a room sound. Let's say you had a pair of stereo room mics out in the room in a studio. Let's say you've got like a 20 by 40 live room and you've got a drum kit out there and you just want to pick up the room, primarily the drums, but you also want to maybe get the guitar amps, whatever is bleeding into the room so that you could add that stereo pair to your mix, maybe to liven it up. Um, might be cool if those mics were an Omni. That way they are getting signal and reflections off of all four walls and the floor and the ceiling in the room. So it's a different sound. Um, something I used to do back in the day was record a French horn. You know, the, the bell is behind the player, blows to the rear. So if I wanted to get a really round, pretty full sounding French horn if I were doing a French horn overdub, which is something, frankly, engineers don't get to do all that often. But I did on a few occasions and I would stick the French horn player about six feet away from a corner, usually with some wood paneling on the wall, have the French horn player blow into the corner and stick a microphone kind of equidistant, maybe three feet from the, the horn's bell and three feet from the wall. And the sound I got was amazing because you picked up the richness of, of all the resonance of the horn rather than just cramming a cardioid mic right up against the bell. So there you go on that. Um, also, if you are doing orchestral recording and you want a pair of stereo mics that uh, are just out in the room, um, Omni might be a good choice for that. And here's my all-time favorite. Um, a lot of people would disagree with me, but I developed my engineering chops very at a very young age, um, back in the uh, there I am, back in the early '70s. And um, while other guys would would stick a microphone right in front, like six inches in front of every horn in a horn section, and put all the horn players in a straight line. I once saw a guy named Tom Dowd, legendary engineer producer, um, put the horn players in a semicircle and take one microphone, I think it was an 87, and put it in Omni and have all the players kind of looking at each other because they're in a semicircle. So they got each other's vibe and feel and, and they synced up together on nailing you know, their hits. And having that mic in Omni um, got all of them. And yeah, you'd have to adjust the blend because you didn't have an equal amount of, um, you didn't have individual microphones. So you would have to adjust the blend by having the horn players move in or out. But the overall, the end result was incredible. Um, figure eight microphones are really, really handy for something you've probably never heard before. So let's imagine that this is a figure eight microphone. And if that were the case, it would pick up equally from this side and from this side. Let's say you're doing a jazz session and you don't own any Neumann U87s, but you rented a couple for the jazz session because you wanted to put some really classy sounding microphones on the drummer's kit. Um, you can use a microphone in a figure eight pattern between the tom-tom -tom and the cymbal. Rather than thinking of overheads, who says a microphone's got to go up there? Overheads. If you want to pick up cymbals and you want to pick up tom-toms, um, use the same microphone in figure eight and you get the tom-tom -tom here. So you would probably put the mic closer to the tom-tom -tom and probably a couple of feet away from the cymbals and you would be shocked how good that sounds. And the cool part is you've got rejection here and you've got rejection here. So that means that you're going to get the left side of the drums on the left side and the right side on the right side because the mic will be rejecting from the sides and only picking up from the bottom and from the top. So there's a really good use case for figure eight. Um, let's see. Oh, piano. Um, Miking a grand piano with a figure eight microphone, um, I, I see all kinds of mistakes that people make with all kinds of, they try MS patterns, XY patterns, all these fancy things because they read about it in, in an engineering book or they saw it on YouTube. 
And yes, there are use cases where you want those mic patterns, but you know what? They're complex, they invite phase problems, and most home engineers just don't have the year's experience to handle that stuff. So if I were going to mark, uh, mic a grand piano, for Lasco's first rule of micing a piano is put the microphones where the strings are being hit by the hammers. Not right up by the hammers themselves, but there's no point in putting two microphones four feet away inside of a grand piano where one microphone is by the lowest octave and the other microphone is by the highest octave when 90% of what is going to be played is going to be played with two hands in a middle octave. So take those two microphones and put them over the strings that are actually going to be vibrating and producing the sound in the middle octave. Um, and we'll talk about the phase relationship in a little bit when I get on to phase. But here's the cool thing. If you want to get the mics fairly close to the piano strings and get some of the lid because you've got it open, um, but you don't want to get a lot of cross chatter between the low end part and the high end part. I'm doing that with the wrong hands. Um, so put the mics in figure eight. Therefore, you get some of the lid, some of the strings, but you don't get a lot of sound coming in from the sides. Trust me, that works. Um, I've only done it with 414s and 87s, but sounded great. Also, another great use case for uh, figure eight is when you're doing a duet in the studio. Um, you could do it in Omni. I used to love having the singers facing each other, spitting all over each other, which in the post-COVID days, probably not cool. But back in the day, that's what we used to do. If we did a duet, <clears throat> we would have the two singers facing each other from probably you know, six inches away from the microphone um, on each side. And if you put it in Omni, that works, but you're also inviting some of the room reflections in. Whereas if you put the mic in figure eight and one singer sings into one side, which is cardioid, the other singer sings in the other side, which is cardioid, you are avoiding some of the bleed and you are avoiding a lot of the room reflections that you probably don't want in that situation. So there you go. Um, microphone mistake number three not knowing where the front of the frickin' microphone is. This is the one I see on YouTube all the time and it completely freaks me out, but I see this all the time. Not knowing where the front of the microphone is. So we know that's the front of the microphone, right? Like that, pretty easy. I have seen so many people you that are doing podcasts in particular, but a lot of like home demo recording people um, that are doing kind of newbie starter sessions, maybe even to, into GarageBand, are using a, a really popular USB mic that is a fine microphone. Uh, it's called, a, 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 it's made by Blue Microphones and it's called a Yeti. And it looks a little bit like this. And I see people using it like this because they're so used to seeing people talk into end fire microphones like this that now they went out and got themselves, you know, $150 uh, USB mic that's a condenser and it's cardioid. And they're talking into it like this because they didn't read the instructions and they don't know any better. Uh, they had no formal training. So the mic is picking up either there or down there and they're talking into it right here makes no sense to me. So don't forget microphone mistake number three, not knowing where the front of the microphone is. Yep, it's true. Microphone mistake number four, not knowing how to avoid cancel phase cancellation when using stereo mics or two mics on the same source. Um, I don't know why, but People that record acoustic guitars oftentimes want to record them in stereo. <sighs> for a pop record, a country record, a rock record, for most records, no. You don't need an acoustic guitar recorded in stereo with a full band in the mix. You're not going to hear the stereo. Even if you are recording um, Andre Stepanian, uh, probably our best classical guitar player and flamenco and all those other finger pick styles on uh, gut string guitars or nylon string guitars. If I were doing a session and he were, he was the only artist on the record, it was a solo record. 
I would consider recording that in stereo. But you really have to know what you're doing because stereo miking, if you get the, the rule is three to one, I think. I should have brushed up on that this weekend. It's either two to one or three to one. The distance but from the mics to each other should be either two to one. Can somebody fact check me on that and let me know in the chat? Uh, I think it's three to one, three, three times as far away. So let's say you're six inches from the guitar, you should be 18 inches between the two microphones. So if I were going to mic uh, Andre Stepanian uh, playing classical nylon string guitar, I would take my ear and move it around and listen for the sweet spot. Um, it's people, you know, mic acoustic guitars. Oh, the microphone should be on the 12th fret. The microphone should be on the 14th fret. It doesn't matter which fret. The fret number means nothing. It's meaningless. It's, somebody came up with that and it spread like a virus. Um, you put the microphone where it sounds best. And I was taught that by one of the greatest engineers of all time, a guy named Tom Dowd. Google him, read all about him, watch the video about his life. Um, <clears throat> anyway, he taught me, you get down on your knees and you move your ear around and you listen to where it sounds best and that's where you put the microphone. So if I were gonna record a stereo session with Andre Stepanian uh, playing classical nylon string guitar, I would put my first microphone there and I would probably put it about four to six inches out from where, let's say, his fingers are picking on the strings. Then I would look in the direction of 18 inches away because I want to be three times what the distance between the instrument and the mic is, and I would probably put the other mic there. And maybe if I were going to take the approach of those stereo mics, one is primarily picking up the low end and one is picking up the higher end stuff, I would probably roll off everything below 100 hertz, maybe 200 hertz on the low end, on the high end microphone, so that I'm just not getting a lot of that low end information in there. But frankly, it's not going to sell one more record. It's not, I, I don't get it. I'm not anti stereo mic. Oh, maybe I am anti stereo micing guitars. I don't know. But um, for a regular rock, pop, or country record, hell no, don't do that. So you are inviting phase cancellation, which means the same sound source is getting to these two microphones a split second apart. And it's causing a phase problem. And how a phase problem manifests itself is by causing certain frequencies to drop out. And that is determined by where the phase cancellation is happening because of how close the mics are, all kinds of little factors that go into that, which I don't have time or the graphics to explain today. Just know, anytime you put two microphones on the same source, you are asking for trouble. Piano, I, I can't tell you how many times I would be in a control room <clears throat> with somebody who was kind of graduating from being an assistant engineer to a full engineer, and they'd go, the piano sounds really thin. So how do you check for phase problems? By putting those, panning both pan pots, the left and the right side, panning them up the middle and making it mono or hitting a mono button. And if you hear a bunch of frequencies drop out when they're straight up the middle in mono or you hit the mono button, you've got phase cancellation going on. So you have broken the rule of the three to one ratio and that's what's causing it. So, Acoustic guitars and pianos are probably the two biggest offenders. Another place that happens a lot is on drum overheads. I don't know why, but I see people on drum overheads putting two microphones like right in the middle of the kit, hanging over it and doing that down and out. It can work, but you should be an experienced engineer that knows what problems, phase problems sound like before you do that. Because if you don't know how to recognize, identify those problems, you could end up recording all your drums for a full album without a phase overheads. Can it be corrected? Yeah. There are plugins that can fix it. Um, you, <laughs> well, you certainly wouldn't want to, the closer you get them to the middle, the more frequencies you're going to lose. My advice when recording drum overheads is avoid phase problems by putting one of your overheads about 
12 to 18 inches above one of your cymbals, your crash, and your other mic directly over your ride cymbal, 12 to 18 inches above it. That way they're far enough apart and close enough to the source, and you'll probably get really good sounding overheads, and you'll get the sound of the full kit. There's no law that says drum overheads have to be three feet or four feet or five feet above the kit. The further you go up there, the more dangerous it is. If you want to get the sound of the room, use room microphones and bring those in gradually. Those too could cause phase problems. So know what phase problems sound like. Take, take an afternoon and set up a pair of stereo mics and try to cause phase problems and then pan things to the center in mono so you can identify what they sound like. Um, okay, I covered that. Wow, we're already up to mistake number five. Microphone mistake number five is not understanding what the proximity effect is and how to avoid it. Proximity effect is simply when you get the microphone too close to the source and it sounds fatter, it sounds tubbier, um, sounds boomy or bass heavy. And more often than not, in my personal experience, I've seen it happen because I've never made the mistake, but some other people I know have. <laughs> uh, it happens on lead vocals and acoustic guitars a lot. Um, people will try and get an acoustic guitar mic like right up where uh, the fretboard meets the sound hole and they'll get it that close and they go, why does it sound so boomy? Well, for one, you're getting a lot of the stuff coming out of the sound hole directly because you're two inches from it. Um, and the other reason is the proximity effect. Um, I think it only happens if memory serves correctly. Proximity effect only happens in the cardioid pattern. I don't believe that it happens in Omni, but most of you are going to be working cardioid anyway. Um, and it's definitely more pronounced with condenser microphones. I think that dynamic microphones still have the problem, but because they have less sensitivity, um, I can't remember a time where I ever encountered proximity effect getting something too close to the source with a dynamic mic. So unless you've got a singer with like a Steve Perry vocal range or maybe a, a female singer with a really wispy voice and you want a little more body out of that singer, um, then get the singer closer to the mic and take advantage of the proximity effect. Some of the problems you could have with that, or a problem you could have with that though, is that they will tend to do this when they sing. So proximity effect kicks in there and not as much there. So just be aware of that most people don't know about it. Um, they don't know how to avoid it and they don't know how to make it their friend when it might come in handy. Um, all right. And do I ever give you just the amount of mistakes that I say in the headline? Nope, I'm giving you a bonus today. Microphone mistake number six is close miking instruments that probably shouldn't be mic'd closely. Bing! I don't know why people do this, but close miking strings. I've literally seen engineers have, let's say, four violins, two violas and a cello, okay, in a fairly small studio. Uh, and they will put a microphone over every violin, over every viola, and right up to the cello. And then they sit there and they go, <clears throat> doesn't sound natural. It sounds very edgy, sounds very strident. Well, that's because we normally don't hear those instruments with our ear a foot above them. We normally hear those instruments in a concert hall or at least some sort of larger room, not in a bedroom studio where they're being mic'd from 12 inches or 18 inches above them. And you want the sound of all the instruments blending together. That's what gives them that kind of natural, organic, I don't know, the intonation, you know, the minor differences in intonation, the minor differences in the bowing. Those things add up to give you a very natural and desirable, in my opinion, um, string sound. So don't close mic strings. It doesn't work. You'd be much better off, honestly, taking one microphone in Omni and putting it like 
four feet above the section, the violins, um, or even four feet away at a 45 degree angle, you know, like seven feet in the air, 45 degree angle, maybe six feet away from the violins and just looking at them like, I don't know if you can tell it, like that. <laughs> Uh, you want some air. You don't want that strident, edgy, stringy, bowy, rosiny sound. It's bad. Um, another example that I've seen, I alluded to a little bit ago, is close miking horns. Um, some of the people I learned from, I, I, I would sit there scratching my head why they did it. I don't know why they did it. Sometimes, Professional engineers working in big dollar studios have to play this little game of smoke and mirrors and impressing the clients because you want the clients to feel like you are going to every possible extreme to make it sound good. Sometimes the right answer, the right application is a single microphone. It just sounds better and works better and it's just faster. But if you're getting paid by the hour as an engineer and you wanna make your clients think that you're going to every extreme to make their project sound amazing, Sure, might you stick you know, a, a separate microphone on each of three trumpets, each of two trombones, each of you know, a, 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 all three kinds of saxophones? Yes, you would. And you'd spend time setting that up and burning some studio time while you're doing it, and then EQing each one and setting levels for each one, probably putting compression on each one. So before you know it, you just got paid for half an hour to 45 minutes of getting a horn sound. Or, if you're a really good engineer, in my personal opinion, you would take one microphone and put that horn section in a semicircle, put the microphone in Omni, and have those guys blow while they're looking at each other and backing up, you know, you, uh, trumpets, back up six inches, um, Barry sax, come in four inches, and then have each player drop a quarter or some sort of coin by their left toe. So when they go back out to the room after going to the men's room or eating lunch or coming in the control room for a playback, they can get right back to where they were standing once you got that blend. And trust me when I tell you that getting a blend from a full section of string players or horn players um, in an Omni microphone is magical. And you might think, but it's not stereo. You're right. It's gonna be stereo when you do a second pass of that same blend. And now you've got this rich, beautiful sound with a section sounding like they should really sound, and then just double track it. I don't mean take it you know, in, in digital land where you just take it and bounce it to another track. Um, you could hypothetically take it and send it to, you know, put pan the first group on the far left and the second group on far right, the second group being like a 65 millisecond delay of the first. Honestly, I would just do two unique passes that were executed well, and it will sound beautiful. If you really want to go for it, you could go for a third pass and pan that down the middle. Um, and you'll get a sound that you will absolutely love, and the horn players will come in the control room and go, wow, I've never heard it sound that good. Trust me, I got to take a bow on my horn sound many, many times, and I learned that technique from Tom Dowd as well. All right. Um, oh, I want to add that we've actually had taxi members <laughs> where the, the screeners, while listening to um, a track for a submission, the screener commented the horns or the strings don't sound realistic enough, and the member got incensed. This has happened, I don't know, maybe a dozen times over the year where the member's absolutely incensed. Those are real horn players. I hired a real horn section and recorded them. Yeah, but the engineer probably put the microphone right there, right up next to the bell, and it just sounds like crap, and it made those real horns sound like a bad sample. <clears throat> Excuse me. So don't do it, folks. No close miking. And now for some microphone tips with more graphics. Um, there are so many variables, so many variables that affect how you mic different instruments. Experimentation and experience will help you learn and get better. And sadly, 
if you're working in a home studio, mostly on your own stuff, you're not going to run into too many occasions where you're going to be miking a horn section or a string section. So I get that. Um, <clears throat> back when I was learning, you know, might do three string sections a month or four or five horn sections a month. So it was something that I got to witness very many times in my first couple of years and then do very many times for the next, I don't know, 12 or 14 years. So I've got a lot of experience. You don't get that experience working in a home studio, so just go back and watch this episode. Excuse me. Guess what? I'm drinking a rock star today. <laughs> and there we go, the famous rock star burp. Okay, microphone tips. And one size does not fit all, remember that. Um, for instance, a snare drum. What type of snare is it? Is it, you know, a big old black beauty? Is it a three and a half inch piccolo snare? Is it tuned really high for jazz? Is it tuned really low, or not really low, but somewhat lower, you know, for pop or R&B? Um, what key and what octave are we talking for the song? That can have a big effect on how your snare sounds. Um, what type of song? Is it jazz? Is it country? Is it pop? Is it rock? Is it speed metal? All those types of genres and types of songs within those genres and the key that it's in and the octave that the players are playing in. If there's a lot of mid-range information because you've got like a synth part, um, a piano part that's being played in the middle octave, um, a crunchy guitar part that's in the middle octave, and vocals that are in middle octaves, um, it's gonna be harder to hear the resonant sounds of a snare drum that is also tuned and mic'd in such a way um, that it, it won't let it pop out. And then you end up giving it more level and it messes up your meters and it affects your mix and you add a lot of compression to it so that you're not over, you know, driving the meters <clears throat> crazy and, and your stereo outs crazy. But then it sounds like overly compressed and it doesn't sound like a snare drum should, in my opinion. Um, are you looking for a boomy sound, a rich sound, or a thinner, jazzier sound? Is the drum damped? Um, you know, do you have a, my favorite tool, a sanitary napkin on it? Um, oh, a wallet. Everybody used to put wallets, drummers put wallets on a drum, which I found funny because as they hit the drum, the, the wallet would march across the drum and the sound would change. So you'd start out with a really dead sound. By the end of the song, the wallet was hanging half off the rim and now you've got a live drum sound and the drummer walks in the control room and goes, how come my snare sounds differently at the end of the song than it did at the beginning? Hmm, I don't know. Um, what, type, what type of room are you recording the drum? Um, is it a live room? Is it a dead room? I, I had a, a little epiphany the other day. Um, I haven't had a recording epiphany in a very long time, so this is kind of exciting for me. I bought a, a new reverb, um, oh God, what was it called? Crystalline, made by Audio Baby, I think. Um, and it's an algorithmic uh, reverb plugin that was, I wanna say, 50 bucks or 79 bucks, wasn't horribly expensive. Uh, but as I was doing some research for something, I kept running into people that were re reviewing it and it just sounded amazing. The reviewers all loved it and it sounded amazing. So I said, what the hell? And I downloaded it and it sounded so good. It sounds so good. Um, I barely use, I just experimented with it for like a half an hour, but it just sounds so good. And the one thing that struck me was you could record instruments in a really dead room like we used to use in the 70s with like carpeted floor, carpeted wall, or Sonics foam on the wall. You know, everybody wants to record in live rooms now with like wood floors and a reasonable amount of reflections. Doesn't matter. It's actually easier, believe it or not, a lot easier in my opinion, to record stuff in a totally dead room, but because there are so many great reverbs with incredible room simulations on them, um, it almost doesn't 
require you to record stuff in a live sounding room. It's kind of more fun, but it takes more skill to know how to manage the reflections in that room. It's just easier. You can make a lot more mistakes in a dead room and you can fix the fact that it's dead sounding by using reverb plugins like I think it's Audio Baby Crystalline. It really, really, really sounds good. Yep, sounded like Crystalline by Audio Baby. That's the one. I really, really like it so far. Like I said, I only played around with it for half an hour. Um, so far, so good. Um, where's the drum being hit? Some drummers are really reliable and hit like in a three inch center in the middle of that drum and their stick is like on a, I don't know, 30 degree angle and they hit and they're getting it with the tip. And are they using nylon tip snares or wood tip snares? All these things affect the sound. So the engineer's job is to think, well, what's appropriate for this song? Is it a ballad with a big goosh? Um, is it speed metal with a crack? Um, is it jazz brushes? All these things, the type of song will tell you what it should sound like, and then you need to know how to make the microphones work for you to do that. But the room comes into play. The drummer's touch, the, the amount of hit uh, or you know force that the drummer's using. Big one. Um, how tight are the snares? <laughs> I once had a drummer throw a fit uh, my snares don't sound snarier <laughs> or snary enough. Snary enough. <laughs> Try and say that three times. And I finally just went out in the room and said, hit that drum. It's he had those snares so incredibly tight that they barely vibrated. It sounded like a piece of, you know, paper like this sitting on top of a comb and hitting it. I mean, there was no, <laughs> there was no sustained to the snares whatsoever. You could have the snares too loose, and that's a problem as well. So then um, you want to think about mic choices. Well, everybody's got an opinion on what to mic a snare with. My personal choice, and it's worked time and time and time and time again for me, and even when I went to great lengths to try other microphones, even much more expensive microphones on snare drums, what did I go with? The trusty, venerable, indestructible, always sounds great on a snare drum, Shure SM57. Love that microphone on a snare. Um, I've used them on Tom Toms, didn't sound as good. Works really well on a snare. So now, check this out, kids. Look at that. I borrowed a snare drum from our head screamer, screener, who was a world-class drummer. Um, and so I mic'd it up. And I wasn't all that happy with this shot, to be honest with you, because it doesn't really show the angle of the microphone all that well. But just know, here I'm going to go back to me for a moment, that I see a lot of people making this mistake, where they're miking the rim. If this is the head of the drum, they mic it so that the, the capsule of the mic is about two or three inches away, which is about the right distance, but they're looking at the rim and the head. That doesn't work so well. Um, it doesn't sound as good as raising the mic up just a pinch more and angling it so that the capsule is looking at the center of the drum, assuming that the drummer is a good center hitter. If the drummer's hitting with the stick at about 30 degrees in the center of the drum on a consistent basis, you will get such a great snare drum, by snare drum sound by taking a 57 and having that capsule looking at where the rubber meets the road in the middle of the drum. Trust me on this. Um, okay, so I have used 414s, which are fairly expensive, and 87s on drums. Um, I think I've probably had about four mics get wiped out in my career um, back in the day. Uh, nothing is uglier than sitting in a control room when a drummer whacks a 414 and literally just shreds it. Like the whole top half of the microphone comes off. Um, you will get in trouble from your boss, trust me. <laughs> I have destroyed a few microphones like that. So then I, I started limiting myself to only using like really expensive condenser microphones 
on drums. If it was like a jazz kit with, you know, a polite little jazz drummer or somebody using brushes, you can use, you know, really expensive mics all day long because a brush won't kill it. But um, I'm telling you, the humble little Sure 57 on a snare drum is the way to go. Here, I did take one more shot. Um, there you go. There's a top-down shot, a bird's eye view in my office. Um, and I see Craig had a little couple pieces of like double sticky tape on there for deadening. Um, can you use a 57 on a bass drum? You can. Um, it's going to be a little attacky. And I'll, you know what? I'll talk about bass drums. I'm going to talk about guitar amps right after this. And then I will talk about bass drums. Don't let me forget. Um, there are a bunch of different mics people like on, on bass drums. Um, and frankly, some of them weren't invented or on the market back when I was working in studios. So I can't really comment other than people I respect on making records that I think are really great sounding records have used them. So that's a pretty good indication, but we'll talk about that. All right, let us move on to guitar amps. Yes. And there we go. That is my own famous little guitar amp. That's a, what's it called? A Pro Fender Pro Junior, I believe, with a 10 inch speaker and 70 watts of tube power. The nice folks at Fender gave me that like in 1994. So that amp is, is actually, it's almost vintage. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got really low hours on it. Like once a year, I, I break out my Strat at home and play it through the amp just long enough to piss off my family or the next door neighbors. That amp gets really loud, too loud. Um, anyway, uh, so what can I tell you about? Uh, oh, I know what I can tell you is here's the mistake I see people making all the time miking guitar amps. I'm going to go back to the me shot. I don't know why, but they think that it makes them look smart. If this is the grill cloth of the amp, I see people do this where they angle the mic at like a 30 to 45 degree angle and, and they move it to the somewhere on the paper cone. No, stick that microphone. Uh, I was actually validated. I saw um, Ronan Chris Murphy. Um, did a thing on getting a mic and guitar amps a few years ago, I believe. And uh, he completely validated what I, I know to be true, which is take that microphone and aim it directly at the voice coil. Excuse me, get it right up to the grill. It will sound so much better than taking that same mic and moving it three inches to the right, three inches to the left, three inches higher, three inches lower. It just sounds best right there. Put a little bit of compression on it um, and you're gonna have a great guitar sound. And here's the interesting thing. Something I discovered many years ago, which I believe that Ronan has also done a thing about. I love it when Ronan makes me feel good about what I believe. <laughs> uh, you don't need to have your amp cranked to make it sound good, especially if you've got a, an amp with a preamp in it. It's just drive it hard on the front end going in, but don't make the amp so loud. I once had a problem. There was a song called Woman Pay Your Dues. I can't remember the name of the band. Uh, and this guy had four marshals set up in my live room. And he wanted me to mic all four, each of the four cabinets. I was just rolling my eyes when he walked out of the control room. My assistant engineer, Vince, just fell down on the floor laughing. It's like, really? We're going to put a separate mic on each one of your four cabinets? What is that going to accomplish? Uh, and no matter what I did, he kept going, I want to have more of a bubble. Oh, here, I should go back to the me shot. Whoops. Uh, he was a pretty famous guy back in that day. Uh, I won't mention who it was. He kept going, I, I want it to, the tone to have more of a bubble. It's like, what does that mean? Like you want to sound purple? What, what are you talking about? He said, well, I want to sound like a marshal. He said, it sounds like a marshal. That's what it sounds like out in the room. No matter what I did, I could not make this gentleman happy. Um, 
So what I ended up doing <laughs> is I put a pig nose on a chair. I kid you not. A little pig nose. How big are they? That big? Put a pig nose on a chair, put a 57 right up to the grill, and seriously, that amp was not that loud, but it sounded really good. And when he came back in the control room and listened, we went with the pig nose on the whole rest of the album. I think to be funny, one day before he came in, the next day I took all the marshals and set them up behind the chair. <laughs> <laughs> that he at least had the psychological aspect of the marshals, you know, being there. But it was the pig nose that made it to the record. So it doesn't need to be loud, doesn't need to be a stack of marshals, but this microphone, that close to the grill, hell, let it touch the grill, I don't care. Right at the dead center of the voice coil is going to sound great. Now, in addition to that, there are times that you don't want to have the same sound on every single track of the record or maybe you want your lead to sound a little different than you know crunchy bar chords or something so uh what i do and almost every other engineer on the planet would do sometimes you do it with many microphones but honestly I, there's a thing called a something or other tree where you set up like a deca tree i think it was called where you would set up maybe a stereo pair and a couple of 87s and a couple of 414s and what have you. And you set them all up in this thing that looks kind of like a Christmas tree, for lack of a better way to describe it, and put that somewhere between 6 and 10 feet out from the amp. That way you could just dial in any combination of microphones that your little heart desired. I didn't find that it worked all that well, but what did work well for me was taking an 87 and putting it about three or four feet from the amp. Um, putting, I do like to put amps on chairs. Um, I don't like them sitting on the floor. Um, there are times where I've been in a studio with a highly reflective floor and somebody was doing a screaming lead and I wanted the floor sound. But most of the time, if the amp is not all that big, I would put it on a chair and then also add a mic uh, like an 87 or a 414 or a whatever um, several feet away and you can sit there and blend the two mics maybe sometimes you'll just use the 87 maybe you've got some bell tones and you want to capture a little more room or a little more of the reflections from the floor so just use that mic um, and if you're doing like i said crunchy bar chords or anything that you want more distortion more edge go with the 57 right in the grill it's going to sound great um okay so that's that let's see i've done snare drums i've done guitar amps okay let's talk vocal mics ta-da it's actually not a great shot, but the thing with the, that's one of those little black um, pop filters. So basically I've got two ECM 87s, both from Gage. Um, and notice that the front of the mic is pointing at where the singer will stand. How do you know? Because if you look carefully near the very top of the top microphone, or what is the bottom, near where the XLR connector is, just above the birdcage, you will see the gauge logo. That's a great way to know where the front of the microphone is. Sing at the logo. All right, that's the easiest way to remember. If you're singing um, not at the logo or in the end of the mic, you really need to take some recording lessons. <laughs> the logo. Okay, so uh, in this case, um, I had set it up with two identical mics, but when you look at it from the side, you will see that I did what I've talked about on many episodes of Taxi TV, especially during uh, the lockdown, where you have a problem with plosives. And so if I had that issue, I would set up two microphones like this for the singer and probably put the pop filter on the lower microphone, making the singer think that that's the microphone that is the main mic. So that's where they would blow their sound at that mic, which is obviously straight in front of their mouth. However, and I didn't do the best job of angling that top microphone, um, but as you can see, I, the top microphone is basically, if it were angled slightly more down, would be aimed at the singer's mouth, but not his wind stream. Okay, so here, I'm gonna do a little demonstration now. 
Oh no, where's my, oh here we go. My prop. Look at that. Taxi post-it pads from back in the day. Plosive. Plosive. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. If you put it up here, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. It doesn't move the paper. What a miracle. How did I figure that out? I don't know. Maybe somebody else taught me. I don't remember when I learned that. Probably in my criteria days. Check this out. Matching logos. <laughs> yeah, actually most of the stuff I learned, I was probably working in that room, Studio A at Criteria. Um, anyway, let's go back. This is Eric. Eric is the guy who, is Eric Anderson, he assigns the screeners to listen to your music every day. Um, anyway, so as you can see, there's Eric pretending he's a vocalist, which I'm pretty sure he's not. Um, but you can see that I've psychologically tricked him into singing into the microphone on the bottom, which is probably not the one I'm going to use because most pop filters do affect the sound a little bit. I mean, nobody's going to buy one less record or nobody's not going to sync your song in a TV show or a movie because you used a pop filter and it sounds 2% less good, if that. But check this out, another prop. Um, this was one of the standard pop filters that came with Shirelli's ECM 87s. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. It dramatically cuts down the sound, and as you can see, it's pretty transparent. Um, anyway, I like these. I can't say that I've used one other than checking it out, in, you know, like here on my desktop situation for Taxi TV. It's a little clunky for that. Um, let's try this guy, which looks cool. This is actually like a modern day knockoff of the ones that they had for Neumann mics and maybe some of the early AKGs back in like the 1950s. Um, <laughs> okay, you remember this. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. So this works pretty well too, and it just slides right over the top of the microphone. I can't remember what I paid for this thing. I want to say it was like $6 or $10, whatever it was. Pretty inexpensive. Um, make sure that when you're putting it on that you've got your fader down because trust me sliding this on is going to blow up your monitors um you guys are talking beer come on i am talking about microphones and you guys are being so disrespectful <laughs> anyway the the thing that in theory i don't love about this is it's got foam it's going to be impossible for you to see but it's got foam woo foam on the inside and a piece of nylon mesh on the outside. And I believe that audio-wise, this will sound less good than this. Um, I can tell you that the ones like these guys that had the hoop with the nylon, like kind of the nylon that you would find on a pair of pantyhose or something, stretched across it. I was using those in like 79 through 85. Um, eh. I, I didn't love them, I didn't hate them, but I could tell that singers were affected by having this big thing in their face. They really wanted to look at the microphone. So putting up a visual block kind of uninspired singers maybe to a degree. I don't know, maybe people are really used to it by now. Um, so there you go. Um, we've talked vocals, let's see. I can't remember why I took this shot. Oh, that's that shot. There's Eric pretending to sing again. Another angle, little view of my less than glamorous office. And then once more, before we leave this subject, that works. I'm telling you, if you've got a vocalist that has a lot of popping peas, this will work every time. I love it and I've used it to great effect. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. What else are we going to talk about? Um, oh, somebody wanted to talk about, was it kick drums or tom-toms? I can't remember. Um, 
Coat hanger with pantyhose stretched over it. Yep. Yeah, Glenn Ruger, you're you're right. It is a truly brilliant trick. And let's just give me all the credit for coming up with it and call it the Lasco method of plosive reduction. <laughs> That's what I want to be remembered for when I'm dead and gone is I'm the guy that invented the trick to reduce plosives. <laughs> um, kick drums. Okay, bass drums, kick drums, kick drums. Again, not unlike a snare drum, so many factors go into getting a good kick sound. But if you want to hear what I consider to be an incredibly good kick sound, uh, because I was just listening to it two and a half, three hours ago, is the kick on Michael Jackson. God, what was his biggest song? Um, Thriller. Listen to the kick drum on the song Thriller. Turn it up fairly loud. And I guarantee you, Bruce Swedeen was his engineer, and he was considered like a top five engineer for those years. Sadly, he just passed away in 2020, I believe. Um, but Bruce was considered an engineer's engineer. And Go back to the picture of you, Eric is still up. Thank you. <laughs> Liz says, go back to the picture of you, Eric is still up. All right, there I am. Um, anyway, so what the hell was that? Oh. Bruce Swedeen's kick drum sound on the Michael Jackson record. Um, wow, amazing. And I find that so ironic because today the kids will take, you know, like five different kick drum samples, uh, 808s and God only knows what else, and add subs to it and, and use side chains to trigger bottom end explosions, all this crap. And just listen to the kick drum. If you want to hear a good like standard kick drum, not a drum that you would use for jazz or not a drum that you would use for a ballad necessarily, but a good like pop rock kick drum. Incredible. And, and you got to remember, uh, Bruce Swedeen didn't have triggers and samples on that stuff back then. It was probably a single mic or maybe an additional mic. So here are, are some things to consider. First of all, what's the tempo of the song? How hard is the drummer hitting uh, the beater to the head? Is it a felt beater or is it a plastic beater? Is it a hybrid beater? Um, one of those black curvy beaters, they all sound differently. And what kind of head? Um, and what is the head tuned to? That's another thing. Drum tuning, I, I personally am not like a world-class expert on drum tuning. But I demanded that from the drummers that I worked with, that they had to check their tuning. You know, it's like, don't ask me to get a sound on your drums that sound like crap, Jack. You know, I can EQ and change mics all day long, but a crappy source is going to make a crappy sound every time. So you'd be surprised how many like rock drummers didn't really know how to tune their drums. Kick drum. So tune it. Um, Try to have the drum not be the same note that the key of the song is in because it'll get swallowed by the bass and other stuff that's in a low register and all you're going to hear is the attack. So maybe tune the kick drum, you know, let's say the song's in the key of G, maybe, I don't know, maybe go to a C on it, experiment. You know, but don't have it be the same note most of the time. None of these things are absolute. They're all changeable depending on all the circumstances. You know, that, that's what I don't like about what people teach about recording online is they teach you that one thing that works for them, but they don't talk about the fact that the key of the song, the tempo of the song, the type of beater, the type of drum head, is the drum on a piece of carpet? Is it on a hard surface? Um, is it boxed into the corner of a room where there are reflective walls, you know, three feet away from it? Uh, there are so many variables that go into getting that sound. But all that said, for a pretty standard middle of the road, but really good sounding kick drum sound, 
And personally, I've gotten this sound using felt beaters and you know plastic or hybrid beaters. Um, and that is to take the front head off, which nowadays like, ew, front head off. Yeah, I also take the heads, the bottom heads off of my tom-toms. That's a whole other discussion. Um, <laughs> drummers used to hate me for that, but it worked. It sounded great. When they walked in the control room for a playback, they would go, holy crap, my kit sounds amazing. Yes, you sound amazing. And it was all you. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, front head off. And then I had a pillow. I had a king size, um, not a down pillow with fluffy white down, but a king size gray feather pillow with tons of feathers in it. It smelled musty. It was big and wide, much wider than a regular standard pillow. Um, and it was heavy. And I would lay that into the bottom of the drum and let it be pushed up against the head a reason. Not so much that it made it sound like tick, 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 but that's what I would do with it, you know, uh, let it touch the head. Then I would take a moving blanket folded over so it was about the same depth as the pillow laying in there and lay the moving blanket in on top of the pillow and then might even put a brick or a concrete block in there to hold all that stuff there so it stayed there because, you know, the head's moving, it would back this stuff out. So yeah, put something heavy in there. Could be a weight from your barbells or something. Put, or a sandbag, sandbag would be a good choice. Um, to me, uh, let the drum have a little tone. Let the kick drum have a little bit of resonance. By the way, when you tune it, make sure the drummer knows the star tuning method. Up, down, over, down, eh, down. You're always going to the opposite side of whatever the last thing you tune was. And I always went in a clockwise motion just so I could remember where the hell I was at. Um, there is no hard, fast rule about clockwise or counterclockwise, but you do want to keep going in the same direction so you don't like, uh, did I just do that one? Did I just do the two o'clock glug? <laughs> um, okay, so microphone of choice for me was this Sennheiser 421, which is a black microphone. You've probably seen it a million times. It too is a dynamic microphone. Doesn't sound exactly like the Shure, but it's in the same kind of general category. Um, it's got a little bit of a, a peak probably between one and 2500 hertz uh, and that is because it works well it's made to work well on vocals so they want to give it a little bite up where that vocal range is that works really good for letting you hear the beater and again I used to see people take those microphones and commit all kinds of mortal sins with them they would take a 421 or whatever their choice of kick drum mic was and they would shove it all the way into the drum, like three inches away from the head and aim it right at the beater because they wanted the attack, that click, click, click of the beater. Um, they got none of the resonance, none of the note out of the kick drum. So, oh wow, my computer is going into update mode while I'm talking. Hopefully that won't affect. Um, <laughs> that was a little scary. Anyway, um, Wow, it's 513. Get me talking about microphones. Anyway, a 421, um, probably about 18 inches away from the beater, aimed at the beater, and experiment a little bit. If you've got an assistant or a helper, um, have them put on a set of headphones not plugged into anything for ear protection or a couple of little foamies in their ears. And you know what, have them plug into the cue system with earphones, headphones, so that you can say, move it left, move it right, bring it closer, bring it back a little further. You, there is no absolute prescription that works for every circumstance because the drummer's gonna be different. The amount of pressure he's putting on the pedal, the, the type of beater, the tuning of the head, the key of the song, the type of room, all that stuff comes into play. So if you have an assistant and you can talk to that assistant and say, move it in, move it out. Um, and that's what you do. But for me, my favorite go-to starting point setup was the Sennheiser 421 and uh, probably 18 inches away from the beater, kind of aimed at the beater. Um, with the heavy down pillow, 
with the moving blanket folded sitting on top of it and something heavy holding those two things in place. So there you go. Um, oh, I wanted to tell you about some other mics that I actually researched. Um, I have not used them. Um, AKG D112, I did use one of those once. I personally didn't like it, but a lot of people swear by it, people whose opinions I respect. Um, the Shure Beta 52 seems like a good all-around drum mic. Um, I see it get used a lot on kick drums. Excuse me, I know that a lot of people like the Beta 52s for live kick drums. I don't really know why. I know very little about live sound. Um, the Electrovoice RE20, I saw a lot of people back in my day, probably as many people use the RE20 um, on the kick as, as used the Sennheiser 421. I could never get an RE20 to get sounding even close to the sounds I would get with a 421. I know I'm going to get nasty emails from people, but I've got to say, and I'm so sorry Electrovoice people, but I never liked the RE20. Uh, I knew people that use them on horns because they could handle a lot of level. You could probably fire like a 45 caliber Glock right into the capsule and it would survive it. Um, I see a lot of people using them at radio stations and on podcasts and such. I just don't think they sound that good. Um, and they don't have a lot of level. So you really have to boost the crap out of it. And then you get more, you know, more of the self noise from whatever's in your signal chain. Um, so there you go. Um, but I will tell you something I did a lot was I didn't use a Sennheiser 421 on a kick for a jazz record. I would actually use a Neumann 87 just outside, like right at the outer rim of the kick drum or maybe even, you know, like eight inches outside of it because jazz drummers have a pretty light touch and jazz drums are not meant to sound like rock drums or pop drums are supposed to sound like jazz drums. I was doing a record with a pretty famous um, Jamaican jazz guy. Um, jazz heads in the audience may know him better than I did when I first met him. His name was Ernest Wranglin, um, an older man who had made a lot of jazz records and was well known and well beloved by other jazz artists. Uh, I had no idea who he was and uh, Within an hour of starting the session, he came in the control room and said, uh, young man, you don't do a lot of jazz, do you? And I said, well, I've worked as an assistant engineer on three or four jazz records, um, and I've engineered one other jazz record before. And he goes, well, let me show you how jazz is really done. Now, granted, he came from Jamaica, where they didn't have a lot of high-end studios. They probably had limited gear. And as it turns out, he was 100% right, and I am to this day very grateful to Ernest Wranglin. Um, he said, let us record without headphones. Fair enough. Get us closer together in the room. Move your drum mics away from the drums um, and don't use a 420. He said, don't use that on the kick. So I used an 87 um, and I padded it with 10 dB pad switch on the back. Uh, and it sounded great. So again, there is no absolute prescription. <sighs> okay. Um, Yeah, SM7s, you know, that's another microphone. Everybody uses them, I swear. Remember earlier I said don't don't choose microphones because of the way they look. I think that the Shure SM7 is a pretty classic example of a microphone that's overrated because it looks cool and people use it. A lot of podcasters are using them, radio stations use them. Um, I've used them. I've tried to make them work extensively. I remember when I worked at Criteria and they first came out, uh, the Bee Gees tried doing vocals in them. And, and I, if memory serves correctly, that lasted for a day. And then they went back to using 87s or 47s or what have you. Um, I don't know. I think the SM7, are, they're just boring sounding to me. But they look cool. I mean, come on. The fact that you have to buy a cloud lifter to make the SM7 sounds good, just get another microphone. I mean, really, you know, $99. Enough said. What is an SM7? Like three or 400 bucks? Why? It doesn't sound great. Another microphone, and, and sorry about this um, Sennheiser, but 
The Sennheiser 441, which is very long, it's about probably 12 inches, maybe 13 inches long, long and skinny. It's black, got a black body, silver windscreen or end of it, you know, and, and it's square. It's like fatter than a drumstick um, and squared off and, and long. Um, I, Ken Calais and I um, became friends a few years ago when I had him speak at the road rally, and hopefully we've remained friends, and we love talking about microphones together. He engineered uh, many of the big Fleetwood Mac monster records, um, and Fleetwood Mac loved the Sennheiser 441s. They used them live, and they used them uh, in the studio. I don't get it. Again, they just sounded really boring to me. There's nothing rich sounding about them. The top end, eh. The only thing I ever found that a Sennheiser 441 worked really well on for me was floor toms. I used them on floor toms all the time. I would use uh, AKG 414s on my rack toms and a Sennheiser 441 on my floor tom. Um, any opinions on AKG P420? You know, honestly, I've never used one. A lot of the newer microphones I haven't used. There's been so many microphones that have come out. You know, last time I worked on a record, I think was 1996 or 97. Since then, so many microphones um, have come out that are inexpensive. Many are manufactured in China. Um, what can I say? So no, I haven't used the AKG P420, but I do know a couple other taxi members whose ears I tend to trust, and they've got them and really like them. And it's a pretty inexpensive mic if memory serves correctly. Um, the Telefunken large diaphragm dynamic kick mic for 350 bucks. I would love to hear that. If I was miking of Marion Laird once enough, I'm miking a violin to give some life to virtual string. What's a good difference from the a good distance from the mic to the violin? Four feet, four feet, five feet, six feet, just not 12 or 18 inches. It's going to sound so strident that it just won't blend with the other strings. Um, actually, think about the other strings. You don't want to put that violin in a an acoustic space of its own. If the other strings, if the violin section, you know, sample sounds like it's six violins in, you know, I don't know, Abbey Road recorded with $3,000 mic or $10,000 Sheps microphones or something in stereo, it sounds amazing. You don't want to take a $100 microphone and put it 12 inches from your violin because it's not going to sound like it was done in that room with it. So it's not going to enrich the sound. And no matter what you try and do to get it to blend, it's not going to blend. So distance and air are your friend. Um, have I used the Neumann TLM-103 on acoustic guitar? Uh, I've not. I've used it on vocals extensively. It's a great sounding mic. Um, they're expensive, right? Uh, I'm guessing that's like a $2,000 mic. I don't know. I, I've got to say, and this is not a plug, Shirelli doesn't own Gage, and I would never have plugged it when he owned it, even if I didn't love them. But like I said, I was one of the original six testers where we did blind taste test. Do you like this or do you like that? And we were switching back and forth. And we didn't know what the, we knew that one of the mics was this. I didn't know that the other mic um, was a 414. I didn't know that the other mic I was judging was a Neumann U87. I didn't know that the other mic I was judging was a Neumann U47. And I've got to say, um, in almost every case, Myself and the other testers ended up picking the $99 mic. It just sounded better. So there you go. I don't know. Um, you know what? Um, I've never used a Rode NT1, but I would say that is an extremely popular mic, even with people who are experienced engineers, not just home recording enthusiasts. Um, they just came out with like a generation three or a generation five in that mic. Don't know, but um, Andre, compare the price of a Rode NT1, which is probably around 200, 250 bucks, 
um, compare that to the price of the Neumann and, and order both and, and give them a very fair AB where you match the level and all other um, things, you know, like the distance from the sound source, all those things, and see, um, is it worth spending a couple thousand on one versus a couple hundred on the other? I don't know. Um, Yeah, the Decca Tree is often the best sounding mic in an orchestral library. Uh, I don't disagree with that. Um, I would say the best sounding, I once had to record, I want to say a hundred voice choir in an 80 piece orchestra in a really large church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I can't remember the name of the church, but it was on the it's on Commercial Boulevard in US-1, if memory serves correctly. Big church, huge pipe organ. I think it had the second largest pipe organ in the United States, maybe second largest German pipe organ in the United States. Anyway, we did it with a really nice remote truck. And of course, we had to set up separate mics, you know, um, on each section and on the choir and blah, 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 blah. And then I just took a pair of, I wanna say it was a Sheps um, stereo mic, which back in the 70s was about $3,300, $3,500. And we put it in a little, or no, it, it was actually one of those mics where it had two capsules and you could rotate. It had numbers like 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees. So you could rotate and it was just one long microphone that was probably about eight or nine inches long. And we hoisted it up. I mean, like, you know, 50 feet up and and then angled it at the stage and listened to it, it sounded amazing, amazing. And if I remember correctly, the guy who was the music director was uh, not the nicest guy in the world. He was probably nervous things were gonna go wrong, but he, he was being inappropriately edgy with moi. And I kept my cool, but you know, he's like, let me hear more of the violin mic. Let me hear more of this mic, blah, 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 blah. I was like, dude, just, chill and let me do my thing. Anyway, he came back in the truck and listened to one of the playbacks. He goes, that's what I'm talking about. That sounds amazing. All he was listening to was the stereo mic 50 or 75 feet in the air because it sounded great in the room. So consider that. Um, let's see. fly a stereo mic in a great room right over the conductor's head. I, I would put it out in the audience. Um, conductor might be a little closer than I want, but then again, the closer you get to the band, the more obvious the stereo spread is on, you know, where you will hear the strings over there and the horns over there. The further back in the room because of reflections and the volume of cubic feet, uh, you will get a little less stereo. There were times where I had to carefully bring in the sectional microphones to accentuate certain things. Um, ooh, here's a good one. Um, how do we mic a conga uh, or a djembe? Um, you're gonna laugh. Um, sounds great on congas, <laughs> sounds great. Um, what can I say? There are so many, oh, you know what else sounds great on timbales? But with the timbale, you want a little less of the head and maybe some of the side shell because timbale players will play the, the shells with their sticks. So don't aim for the middle like you would on a snare drum. Pull it back a little bit and aim it so the mic's capsule is looking about three inches in from the edge, from the rim, and also picking up the sound of the shell. By the way, here's something a lot of people don't know. Um, that snare drums, I just learned this. I think I learned it back in the day, but I totally forgotten and something reminded me the other day. That snare drums used to have double rims that were made out of two pieces of metal. And now they've got like a, a, a three part rim that's substantially heavier. They're singles, doubles and, and three layer rims. The heavier the rim, the richer the tone is on the drum. I also learned um, 
I think it's Steve Gadd that actually showed me the song. I, I was working on setting up mics on his kit for like a McDonald's jingle or something in New York once. And he was, I don't have a drum head in my room, but he was taking his thumbs and going around the rim of the drum. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm crinkling. I said, what? <laughs> he said, I'm crinkling. He said, there's glue between um, the plastic of the drum head and, and the rim and you want to break that glue. I said, well, why the hell they put the glue on there if you're just going to break it? He goes, trust me, it works better. Um, so remember that. Anytime you put new drum heads on, go around the edges and crinkle, and then he would take both hands and put his body weight as much as he could in the middle of the drum to stretch the head out, then tighten the lugs all the way around with your hands, and then do the star pattern real tightening with, with the drum key. Um, all right. Wow. We are actually out of time. Um, thank you for joining me for this. You could tell I had a lot of fun working on it. Um, oh, Rick Beato did a great drum tuning video showing that method. Which method? The, the crinkling thing? Um, Honestly, Larry, I don't know anything about the modeling microphones because I've never used one. So if I don't have experience, I don't want to just make it up, although I could. And at this point, you might believe me, but I'm, that's not the way I'm built. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned some stuff. And don't miss next week's show. Oh, first of all, I want to say, give me some thumbs up. Yeah, if you like this, give us a thumbs up. Um, and if you're not a subscriber to the channel, please do so that you can join us for the next show. And next week's show is going to be Sync Licensing Submission Checklist. And I'm going to reach out to three or four members that I know are hitting it out of the park and ask them to put together their personal checklist of things like metadata, um, sample rates, uh, titles, anything that they can think of that helps them present their music to the libraries they work with in the best possible fashion. And we are going to relay that stuff back to you guys right here next Monday. Um, I think that about covers it, ladies and gentlemen. So adios. See you next week and have a good Bye-bye.